Uh, Henry decided to go to, to graduate school at MIT, which has almost no windows, I think. <laughs> um, and um, Sorry, undergraduate school. And then he, he came back to Berkeley to go to graduate school. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, to have him choose to join my group. And actually, um, you know, you, you joined a year before I guess I came to Berkeley, right? Uh, yeah. So he and Paul Kamita, another graduate student, managed to get our labs ready before I moved up from Caltech. Um, and uh, he did a really nice job. He did a lot of different um, and interesting reactions, uh, discovered things that we only found later that we were <laughs> the first to discover. Um, and, and then uh, went to uh, his uh, first permanent position at, at DuPont, uh, where again he was involved in the central research department, did a lot of interesting things, and, and moved up the, the ladder there to um, uh, to, I think, a, a position of really uh, substantial prominence. Um, the, there's, DuPont has undergone a lot of changes in the you know, last few years, some of which I think he'll tell you about. But um, there was a really important person in organometallic chemistry, a sort of icon, I guess, named George Parshall, who I think stimulated a lot of us to think about the practical applications of organometallic uh, reactions. And Henry now has George's job, which is, I think, a major challenge. And so uh, he's thought a great deal about um, where DuPont needs to go to not only develop new chemistry, but to, to make it, a, a, on an industrial scale, um, a really green operation. So without further comment, um, I will allow Henry to talk to you about a journey to sustainability. Okay. Well, Bob, thank you very much for the introduction, and I, I really also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a little daunting and, and uh, in, a, in a big way very humbling to uh, be representing uh, uh, what, what DuPont is doing in this area in such, a, in such an audience and in such a group. I will say that when Paul was talking this morning, and he was, I, was, I was really into things, and he was uh, asking how many of us had, had bones and... and Clicked on that one. Then he asked how many of us had been ground into uh, into the right size uh, powder and subjected to intense heat and uh, and pressure. And I thought, well, yeah, I was a graduate student at uh, Berkeley. No. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I certainly can't do justice to an entire industry. I'm just grateful to be able to describe a little bit about Dupont's strategies and thinking in this area. And it's a work in progress, as the journey title would suggest. Uh, DuPont started in uh, 1802, and uh, we've changed a little bit since then, certainly. Um, but there are many pieces of our corporate DNA that remain unchanged through those, through basically more than two centuries. We're on our third century now. Uh, I could talk about core values for an hour, but I, I really just want to focus on three aspects that I think are especially important when you start to consider green chemistry and especially renewable materials. And those would include, first of all, we're a science company. Uh, EI DuPont was a student of Lavoisier's, and actually the first product that we manufactured, black powder, was, uh, uh, was something that was uh, manufactured uh, with uh, principles of atom economy, uh, principles of uh, green engineering uh, actually in mind, and for its day was, was revolutionary. Uh, secondly, uh, I think, and I'll illustrate this a little bit as we go through the talk in terms of journeys. Secondly, uh, when your one and only product is uh, black powder, uh, you get an immediate appreciation that good safety practices are good business practices. <laughs> and uh, you know that's obvious on inspection, but it's really been the foundation of a journey around product stewardship and more recently sustainability that I think is well founded in this particular example. Uh, and the third is related to that one, and when E.I. DuPont founded the company, he built his house about 200 yards, which is still there, a uh, testament again to, to the green engineering uh, and, and the design principles there, but uh, he built his house about 200 yards from the powder mills in and amongst the, uh, the houses of, of the workers uh, at the plants, at the, at the, at the mills. Uh, his children went to school and, and played with, the, with their children, again, a couple of hundred yards away from these extremely hazardous operations. And it was really the foundation of the company, the philosophy that, that leaders have to have skin in the game and that uh, we're all members of, of the company, we're all members of the community, and in this particular case, with a global community like DuPont, uh, a global company like DuPont, we're part of the global community and we have a responsibility 
uh, to advocate and to say what we think even when it's not politically popular. Uh, so you see DuPont out uh, uh, working with uh, environmental defense on a nano risk framework or, or uh, organizing a number of, uh, of companies to lobby Congress for uh, greenhouse gas legislation uh, to, to put caps uh, and targets in place or you see uh, advocacy for meaningful TSCA reform to give EPA the tools necessary to uh, regulate a, an industry. Uh, so I, I think in that regard, uh, we'll go through those examples uh, one at a time, but I think those are some of the principles that continue to underpin the company. Let's start with science company, that's the easiest. Uh, we spent uh, in 2010 about uh, $1.7 billion on R&D. It was focused in areas which we believe are key to the future so about 85% uh, was dedicated to things that we see as strategic priorities for our company and for the world going forward, uh, with only about 15% uh, dedicated to the legacy of, of, of our past. So that's a major investment in the future. Uh, we have about 8,500 scientists and engineers. They are, uh, again, global uh, in terms of, of uh, their, their geographic distribution, although uh, present in over 75 R&D centers worldwide, about 80% of them are in, I think, eight, and they tend to be clustered in a center of excellence where we can get crosstalk between disciplines and, and uh, businesses uh, at sites around the world. Uh, we also, uh, something I'm, I'm personally proud of, uh, when we went through the worst recession in our company's history since the Great Depression, didn't flinch when it came to the investment in innovation, and uh, that has prepared us well for coming out of uh, of the recession with uh, continued uh, progress towards our goals in terms of, of new products and, and better products uh, coming forward over that, over that period of time. So we are on our third century, and you can think about this in terms of evolution, our first century being uh, the century of explosives, the second being adding uh, chemistry and polymer chemistry and synthetic fibers, a category we, we invented, and, and finally energy to the mix, and then ultimately uh, uh, looking forward towards our third century saying, okay, what has it got to be? And for us, it's uh, integrating uh, bi the tools of modern biology with our traditional strengths in chemistry, material science, and engineering to develop solutions for uh, the kinds of problems that are facing us today and the recognition that, uh, that just as we, whoops, I'm sorry, just as we have uh, undergone uh, an evolution of our, of our product lines, we also have undergone a sophistication, a growing sophistication of our, of our uh, awareness of our, of our uh, planet, and, and that includes, as I mentioned, safety from day one. That one was, was almost obvious by inspection, but really product stewardship in the 20th century. DuPont uh, put in place our Haskell Toxicology Laboratories in 1935. It's the first industrial tox lab in North America, maybe, maybe uh, Maybe Meg or Mike know if it's uh, even more than that. But it was uh, through an awareness that we have to, if we're going to be in these kinds of markets, we have to be looking out not only for the safety of our workers, but also for the safety of our customers and the people that ultimately use our products. And every product that, that DuPont uh, produces has to go through product stewardship reviews at our Haskell uh, facility uh, with tools that, of course, are, are getting ever better uh, over time. And our third century uh, is really one of of sustainability, and this is a journey that we've been on. Uh, if you think about it, uh, in, the, uh, in the 70s, I guess the EPA was constituted in what, 71 or 72? Um, I, I could tell you probably better if we had windows in that, that high school, but, but um, <laughs> we were in an era of, of absolutely complying with all applicable laws and regu regulations, that was our philosophy, but our experimental nature kicked in, and by the mid 80s, we, ran, we, we, we created a hypothesis that just like good safety is, good, is actually in the long run good business practice, even though it may seem like an investment up front, uh, we developed a hypothesis, uh, and we've proven that out again with, with of course, uh, toxicology. The, the new uh, hypothesis was that good environmental stewardship was also good business practice, recognizing, again, it's going to take an investment up front, but if it pays off bigger in, in the end, it, it is absolutely the, the right thing to do from every dimension. And, and by 1994, we had... Uh, conclusively proven to ourselves that that is the case, and we set upon establishing our first sustainability goals for our company. These were environmental footprint goals, and they were set for 2010, and I'll tell you, in 1994, I didn't have a clue how we were going to get there. Um, they were really daunting, but they allowed us to focus our energies on reaching those goals, and when you are both uh, focused on a goal and you're very transparent about reporting it uh, externally, 
it really motivates you to make sure you achieve it. And achieve it we did in 2006. We'd actually met or exceeded all of the uh, goals that had been set in, in 1994. So it was time to reset our metrics for the future. In this particular case, we reset them for 2015. Uh, again, they're, they're quite daunting. But interestingly, during that, that same period, uh, we had a new CEO come in. And he, I think, was looking forward to our third century and saying, how am I going to prepare the company for a third century of growth? And he came to a conclusion that really um, has really resonated with me, and maybe it will with you too. Uh, his recognition was, OK, if, if I want to double the size of the DuPont company during my tenure, um, I can just do more of what we've been doing. And, and that will get us there you know, on, on the kind of trajectory we're on. However, it's quite unclear that the resources are available if, if, to do that indefinitely. In fact, it's, it's, it's clear they're not. Secondly, it's quite unclear that the planet can survive the environmental assault of the developing world developing in the 21st century the way that Western Europe and the United States, North America, uh, developed in the 20th century. There aren't the natural resources available uh, either, so we need to find a more sustainable way for our company to grow. We need to find a more sustainable way for our customers to grow. And that was really uh, the underlying uh, philosophy that went into resetting those, those objectives. And I'm not going to dwell on them. There are nine of them. And they're actually uh, broken into a number of subcategories. I encourage you to go to our website. We're, again, very transparent about uh, reporting not only what they are, but there are annual report cards on how we're doing the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and again, we haven't met them all. Uh, we are making progress on all of them. But what's unique, I think, for us is that along with Chad Holliday's uh, philosophy, not only are we looking at further reductions in our own environmental footprint, which have, have demonstrated uh, big gains for our company over time, but we're also looking to try and help improve the, the environmental footprint of our customers. And, and so that, to us, is, is something that's new. And, and we have organized around uh, mission elements that we believe are going to be critical, not only for our company's future, but for the planet's future, based on populations that are, are growing and developing in terms of uh, affluence. Um, how do we do this? Well, again, uh, taking a little bit from the model of the, of the uh, 90s uh, through the early part of this century, uh, we actually looked at a number of different criteria. And, and you know, to Paul's point about system thinking, there's no one answer. And oftentimes, it's, the answer is a combination of things and situational. But you can't focus solely on one metric and expect that, uh, that everything else is going to be fine. Uh, in fact, you need to look at many different uh, elements of new products and new process technologies. And what we do is uh, examine all of these dimensions before we start any new research program. And we're constantly reevaluating at checkpoints, milestones uh, in these research programs to make sure that we're still on track. Uh, if we can't meet and ex all of these and exceed at least some of these objectives, uh, uh, metrics, uh, areas for, for improvement, then we'll never get to the goals that we've set. So we, we don't even start the research, even though the project may appear to be at least opportunistically uh, economically attractive. Uh, that's a trap, because it may be uh, tactically significant, but it'll, it'll take away your focus from what's strategically important. And we're in this for the long run. We're in this for our third century. Um, I guess the, the other thing to point out is that, as a result, there are dimensions here uh, around uh, uh, cradle to gate and, and ultimately uh, uh, cradle to grave uh, environmental footprint, the amounts of water and energy that are used to produce materials, the impact on climate change, the toxicological risk being the product of hazard as well as exposure potential. And this is a daunting prospect for anybody, but we've also had, again, our, tox our toxicology uh, colleagues working with us to try and give us some tools that help us to uh, look at the big picture in lots of dimensions all at once. And here again, we're building um, and we're, we're uh, are being helped by the advances in academia as well as government labs and agencies where, where we have tied uh, together all of the available data on uh, persistence and bioaccumulation and toxicity and, and also uh, uh, other things around uh, public, public perception and interests and also uh, ultimately transport of, of materials both materials that are used in production, the ultimate materials that are being produced, and the materials of ultimate uh, fate for, uh, for products after their disposal. And uh, chemists will have this, have this at their desktop. And they can look at, 
first of all, uh, for example, intermediates that they might be con contemplating using in a synthesis. Or they can look at uh, hypothetical uh, uh, properties of materials that they haven't yet synthesized by using the, the QSAR tools that are embedded in this, uh, in this analysis. So again, it uses the best available information on a whole range of, uh, a whole range of, of uh, systems elements to come up with uh, the best choices. And in this particular case, uh, as I said, there are uh, questions around environmental uh, persistence, uh, soil mobility, bioaccumulation, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, what's important to recognize is that on inspection you can see, and I'm quite colorblind, but, but I'm, I'm told that not only are these things darker, but they're, they're also red and green. And so you can tell almost on inspection by the, the length of the bar as well as its color and, and shade uh, whether something is, uh, is uh, good or bad in a certain dimension. And it also allows you to, uh, by inspection, if you're looking at, a, at several synthons for a, a, an agricultural uh, uh, product, uh, you can tell by inspection which one you want to really focus on, and you should look at, at where, the, uh, at where the, the long bars are because uh, if something is problematic or expected to be problematic in, in terms of uh, soil mobility in the groundwater, you have to ask yourself, okay, is the way that this product is going to be used throughout its life cycle, including, including disposal, going to cause it to become uh, mobile in groundwater? It, will it become... Uh, uh, something that is soil bound and ultimately migrate into groundwater. So there are lots of complex things you have to think about, but that's why we, why we uh, uh, try and organize it in, in the systems approach to, uh, to uh, materials. Now, I, I won't pretend that our sustainability program uh, is, is completely aligned with all the principles of green chemistry. It's not. The fact of the matter is that uh, there's an economic consideration that goes on top of this, unfortunately, and so I would never suggest that converting uh, toxic waste abatement, if you will, into, into more innocuous uh, materials has anything to do with green chemistry. That's fixing sins of the past. Sometimes, however, uh, there, are, there are situations where that's the fastest uh, way to address a, an issue, and so, so uh, there are elements to that in, in the overall plan. There are also elements that don't really pertain to chemistry, but pertain to biology or, or other disciplines, but nevertheless, I think you could see green chemistry written all over those criteria that I just mentioned. And uh, when you start to get into the lower half of this, of this uh, plan, if you will, for sustainable growth, it's all about green chemistry. And I've listed them in what I consider to be uh, not only the significance that they can have on our overall sustainable footprint as a company, but also on the difficulty in achieving them. So I, I'm going to be talking about things that are uh, uh, renewable, which fit, in my view, into the last category being the hardest, but probably the most significant for, for ultimate sustainable growth. Um, the, the mega trends that we're going after are based on uh, current and expected population growth, and again, uh, involve increasing food production for the planet, decreasing our dependence on fossil fuels, an extension of our legacy in worker safety into protection of people and the environment in general, and then again supporting growth in emerging markets in a more sustainable way than uh, North America and Western Europe uh, developed in the 20th century. So what's our strategy to get there? What are, what are the elements that we're using to pursue uh, such a vision? Well, the first is a basic philosophy that society's needs for everything, food, fuel, shelter, clothing, other basic elements necessary for life are going to need to be met from the available land and solar energy. Just, just as Paul was saying, it's all about energy and materials. And you add on to that human creativity and, and, and you really can change the world. Um, we have some, some businesses that can play a role in that that are, that are not renewable. And, and have to play a role in that. Uh, you know, our, our photovoltaics uh, effort that's aimed at widespread grid parity on non-arable land is, is a, would be an example of that. But really, a lot of it comes down to how are we going to generate all the other things uh, necessary that we as a company can co contribute to through uh, the smart use of the available land on the planet. Uh, so our belief is that the solutions are going to be coming from a couple of sources. One is an improvement in agricultural productivity. We're dedicated to that. You saw about 60% of that R&D spend is focused on that particular megatrend. So we're putting our money where our mouth is. And uh, I will say that, that uh, from my view of that future, it's nothing less than breathtaking in terms of what the potential is. And then secondly, it's integrating uh, DuPont's core technologies in unique ways to, uh, 
to develop solutions that have eluded us in the past and are going to be absolutely necessary to using the kinds of things that are, that are going to be coming from agricultural products or agricultural byproducts. Uh, when you look at DuPont's competencies, we, we don't do everything. We can't do everything. I don't think any one entity can, and nor should, should we even try. But when you look at that R&D investment, it's allowed us to both nurture competencies, deep competencies, technical competencies in the physical sciences and engineering, while over the last 30 years adding a toolkit of modern biology tools and techniques that we can now start to think about in in uh, ways, by merging the two together in ways that, that uh, others may not be able to do or find difficult. And uh, we talked a little bit last night about, about whether, uh, um, whether you can really call uh, uh, this approach integrated science, um, but I, I can assure you, uh, I know Meg, Meg uh, uh, was the one that raised it, I can assure you that, that uh, chemical engineer uh, doesn't really even speak the same language as uh, Bob can attest to uh, some, sometimes the catalysis chemist. So it's a, it's a uh, merging of, of languages and cultures uh, even, in, even at that level. And, and the approach that we've taken is to try and use the markets that we already know well and improve them while also looking for the big step changes in the future. So it's, it's the sort of uh, uh, materials company analogy of think globally, act locally. It's, it's take the steps that you know you can while at the same time keeping in front of you where you want to be so that you don't uh, get diverted into, into areas that are directionally just not useful. Uh, an example of this would be uh, oil and gas. You know, I just talked about renewables. What can get less renewable than serving the oil and gas industry? Well, there are a lot of things, actually. And, and what we're trying to do in this area is recognizing that this is going to be part of the energy solution for and, and material solution for a while, for, for decades still. And we need to find a way to make it more efficient and also more, less environmentally intrusive to uh, both recover and use those materials. And so there are a number of of products that marry together uh, uh, different disciplines in the interest of time. I won't go through all, all of these examples, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for, for all of the complexity that enters into, into this overall picture of, of how do we move ourselves forward towards these, uh, towards these objectives. Uh, alternate energies and energy storage figures prominently in our strategies and in our, in our businesses, and we are, uh, are developing uh, wholesale new products to dramatically improve energy storage and also uh, the utilization of, motor, of energy in, in electric motors, uh, again, using a, a variety of different physical science disciplines. The same can be said for our, our legacy in the protection arena where we've now expanded well beyond worker safety and powder mills to include uh, uh, the protection of, of industrial workers, but also hazmat responders, firefighters, uh, military and police forces uh, with a variety of, of tools that uh, have to be integrated in just the right way for these ever-increasing challenges to our, uh, to our uh, emergency uh, responders. Uh, mentioned uh, about photovoltaics, DuPont has been involved in photovoltaics since the first solar cells were created at Bell Labs that used DuPont crystal and silicon. We don't make silicon anymore, but uh, we make basically everything else that goes into the modern solar cells and are dedicated to, as I said, a couple of major goals here. One is grid parity. Uh, across a widespread uh, part of the planet. Keep in mind that there are some places that today you can already achieve uh, essentially grid parity because electricity is expensive in those places and uh, there's lots of sunlight, but that's not true in general and, and uh, that's a major goal and, a, and a, a, an audacious one at, at the same time. And also, uh, as Paul pointed out, that materials industry is comprised of some pretty nasty stuff and so finding ways to uh, do with less materials to generate the same result, generate more durable materials so that uh, the effective lifetime is, for example, doubled and therefore the environmental footprint is cut in half. Lots of challenges in this arena. Um, but you've probably also noticed that I haven't said a lot about biology yet. And, and that's not because it's not important. As I said, we're spending a great deal on production agriculture. Uh, but when you can start to, to look at things like biofuels and, and our announced uh, uh, technology development efforts which are now in pilot phase for both cellulosic ethanol and also biobutanol and say, okay, well, they're starting to utilize some of the competencies of modern biology and marry together at least a few of the physical sciences, but it doesn't really uh, strike you that we're, doing that, that, that we're doing what I told you earlier, and that's marrying, intimately marrying together these disciplines in a way that, that provides unique solutions. But what surprises most people is when you look at our, our uh, product uh, strategies towards uh, the automotive industry. And here what you find is uh, a, 
in some people's mind, a very surprising mixture of the physical and, and biological sciences playing key role in the products that are being rolled out. And that's because there are really two strategies to serve this marketplace. One is lightweighting vehicles so that they can achieve better fuel economy, whether that fuel is in the form of electrons that are produced by whatever mechanism or whether it's uh, internal combustion or some combination thereof. And, and also the substitution, the wholesale substitution of renewable materials into our uh, petrochemical uh, materials family. So that's something that this is where it starts to appear, and there are a number of other examples, but I, I, I won't go into it. But I can, I can try and illustrate for you some of the, uh, the uh, principles and problems and how we're addressing them in constructing a portfolio of renewable materials to transform at least our company as well as hopefully our customers. So as I said, uh, uh, this is sort of the, the, the uh, roadmap of, of different options to improve our uh, corporation's environmental footprint. The hardest, uh, in my view, but the most significant is a substitution of new feedstocks, specifically renewables, that are inherently more sustainable and can provide solutions to our customers. Now keep in mind, when you look at this, as Bob said, green isn't always good. Uh, Mother Nature makes a lot of really nasty things too, and you can also practice uh, renewable-based chemistries really badly and actually uh, generate products that have a worse environmental footprint than than uh, the things that you're, that you're trying to uh, replace. But uh, as I said earlier, you have to take the full system view into account, and that's what we're really dedicated to, and that's what makes it so hard. Um, and what we're talking about is really the wholesale transformation of our supply chains, going from the ones that we're all very familiar with, converting, uh, uh, digging fossil fuels out of the ground and converting them in refineries into hydrocarbon building blocks for the fuels, materials, and chemicals that are used today in in uh, modern uh, societies, uh, which have the advantages of being well developed and in many cases optimized over you know, 80, 90 years of petroleum chemistry, but they have the obvious disadvantage of being completely unsustainable, uh, uh, not only for uh, the availability of the, the starting materials, but also uh, questionable uh, sustainability for our, our planet when it comes to uh, greenhouse gas levels. Um, you can construct a similar type of picture for renewable materials, and here you'd be taking agricultural products or preferably byproducts and converting them into sugars, which are then the building blocks for the next generation of materials in our view, uh, those being uh, converted into fuels, biomaterials, and biochemical uh, specialty ma materials, if you will, having the advantage of at least having potential for substantial uh, improvements in a number of environmental footprint metrics but also having the disadvantages. They look small down here in the corner, but let me assure you, they're huge. You need completely new technologies to do this. This, this is not something that, that uh, can easily be done. Even the oil biorefinery is still something that, that uh, is on the, on the uh, talking uh, stages and, and the, the testing stages as people are, as Bob mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. So this is, this is hard, and starting with, uh, with uh, sugars or, or sugar precursors like cellulose is even, even more difficult but can pay even bigger dividends. Uh, and I think that's, that's the point here, is that if you want to change the world, um, be a chemist today. Uh, be a green chemist today, because the opportunities are very, very challenging, but enormous. You can, you can literally change the world. Uh, if you look at it, uh, there are a lot of problems that you can solve. And in addition, you can start to not only change the environmental footprint of what's done in modern industry, but you can also change the geopolitical climate in the world, right? By just changing, the, uh, uh, changing where we resource natural uh, uh, materials. So it's worth it, but it's tough. Uh, what are some of the specific challenges uh, that we're working on and how do we approach it in this particular area? Well, first of all, we focus on uh, what the market is asking for, what the opportunities are. Usually those are petrochemical materials that are not very, that are not produced in very satisfactory technologies today. And believe me, there are actually quite a lot of them. Uh, participate broadly across the value chain. That is from seeds to end-use applications development. I told you about increasing uh, the productivity of modern agriculture. That's a part of it, designing seeds that can improve yields not only of, of grains, but also cellulose is another aspect of that, and then also targeting areas where our unique set of competencies in biology and chemistry can contribute to a solution. We are also looking uh, systematically at opportunities for two of the major failure modes for these new technologies, those being uh, incumbency and scale. 
and we're using partnerships in the recognition that no one company, certainly not ours, has all the answers and that speed to achieve these goals is essential. So partnering with, with academic labs, partnering with uh, other companies, partnering with government labs and agencies, it's all part of it to, uh, to reach success quickly. And then ultimately working to uh, decouple the food and biomaterials and fuel supply chains as quickly as possible. Um, there are some things, some, some, uh, some wind in our sails. Uh, after, after a period of 25 years where oil bounced around between 20 and 20 plus or minus $10 a barrel, uh, in 2004 something fundamentally changed. And I think that's, uh, personally, I believe that's the developing world developing with an with a, a unexpected speed and, and voracious appetite with an emerging middle class that was both huge and wanted the, uh, the benefits that emerged nations have been enjoying for quite some time. Uh, in any case, uh, we, saw, uh, the, the, we saw rises in the price of basically everything, ranging from, from corn and sugar to petroleum. But if you notice this, when, the, when you normalize these things to 1989 prices, the changes in petroleum have been both more severe and also uh, much more volatile. And both of those things are problems for, modern, for the modern chemical uh, materials industries. And so that creates an opportunity. Um, the next thing that, that again, uh, Bob alluded to is that when you go to the marketplace, what you find is there are some niches where, where renewable materials will be bought even if they have inferior cost and performance, but there are not very many of them. In, in most cases, uh, people have a bias towards purchasing something that is either renewably sourced or environmentally uh, superior in terms of its, uh, its footprint. But... They really aren't willing to pay more for it, and they're really not willing to sacrifice much in the way of performance. So we believe uh, that it can be done, but it's an opportunity for the long term. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's going to take some step change developments of technologies that do not exist today. Uh, and this challenge is further exacerbated by two issues that I'm going to mention here briefly, those being incumbency and scale. Uh, incumbency is quite simply the fact that there are barriers to introducing something new. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of dedication and energy to generate new products and uh, so that's something that is automatically a barrier. You're having to invest up front a lot of, uh, a lot of resources just to get to the point where, uh, where petrochemical alternatives have been uh, enjoying uh, life for 70, 80 years. Uh, in addition, traditional market spaces are oftentimes saturated with lots of offerings. People have choice. Uh, and, and even those petrochemical processes are not standing still. They continue to be improved. So the, these are some daunting challenges. Uh, even something as, as relatively straightforward, I don't mean to be um, pejorative, but, but uh, something as relatively straightforward as reformulation uh, of products with new actives uh, turns out to have su sufficient barrier in, in terms of uh, cost that you really have to provide some incentive for people to even want to try that. Uh, in addition, if you start to look at, at uh, uh, things that have uh, completely new uh, chemistry basis, uh, completely new performance attributes, now you've got a, a doubly hard barrier because not only do people have to reformulate, they have to have to adjust the performance and also the expectations of their customers. So very, very big challenges. And at the same time, keep in mind, you have to pay back the R&D and uh, new plant investment, and you're going up against something that's been produced in depreciated equipment for many, many years. So lots of challenges with incumbency. The other one is scale. And this is quite simply put, it's hard to manufacture uh, specialties to compete on cost with commodities. Uh, the bottom line is the synthetic materials landscape is now populated by the Darwinian survivors of 70, 80, 90 years of petrochemical-based synthetic chemistry. If you look in the polymers world, uh, that's, uh, that's true in spades. There are now uh, mega platforms, probably half a dozen to uh, maybe 10 of them, that are produced on multi-billion pound a year scales, which have people have figured out over that time how to customize, how to blend, how to adapt to virtually... Uh, 90% of the application space uh, for these materials today. And so when you bring in a, whoops, when you bring in a new uh, product, it's got to compete with these materials, and it's unlikely that you're going to be producing a brand new product on a billion pound a year scale, yet you're going to have to go up against plants that may be built on that, that scale. And when you look at the productivity of, of uh, 
of capital and, and uh, financial performance of, of uh, these types of, of assets, what you find is that uh, there's a very linear log-log relationship. For all, I've only plotted uh, general categories, but if you start to populate this with individual uh, components out of chemical marketing report or something else, what you'll find is a remarkable log-log correlation between price and volume of production. And uh, what this really means is that if you're going to be producing something on 100 million pounds a year scale, it's probably going to cost about 10 times as much as something you're producing on a billion pound a year scale. And that's a problem for introducing uh, new materials. So uh, is it hopeless? Well, no. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, we do have some things that are some, some wind at our back when it comes to uh, when, it, when it comes to the raw material pricing and the volatility in petrochemicals that's been experienced since 2004. In addition, uh, we can use partnerships to expand the market opportunities and accelerate uh, the introduction of some of these materials to help us share the risk, if you will. And and uh, when you look at the way that Dupont is approaching this, I mentioned to you that we're working on uh, producing. Uh, improving production agriculture literally acre by acre and uh, seed by seed, improving the seeds, uh, also improving yields through introducing uh, better and, and more sustainable crop protection chemicals uh, so that we can get more per acre produced and we can do that around the world. Uh, in addition, we're working with farmers and people who are experts at collecting uh, agricultural products and now byproducts, cellulose specifically, and with others who have experience in large-scale fermentations, as an example, to allow us to quickly take some of these technologies to market. And, and you can see that in the area of biomaterials, where we partnered with Tate & Lyle, uh, a company that does, uh, that does uh, look at uh, biorefineries. And we've taken a byproduct of manufacturing animal feed and turned it into a monomer for our Serona polytrimethylene terephthalate polymer. Uh, similarly, we're partnering with, with other companies who bring either technology or market access in the area of of biofuels to help us reduce the risk there, to share in the risk, reduce the risk that we were just uh, talking about in terms of incumbency and scale. So there are ways that, that partnerships can dramatically enhance that. And I haven't even touched on uh, what goes in here, what goes inside the, uh, the pipes and reactors, which is the basic chemistry and, and transformation science that's necessary uh, and in which we depend on partnerships with different, uh, as I said, labs around the world in, in virtually every in every uh, avenue, whether it's academics, government labs, or, or institutes. We've also constructed an organization within the company that is charged with incubating and nurturing these new businesses and partnering with other established businesses within our corporation to supply new materials to them and also to take the outputs, for example, the improved uh, cellulose production out of our uh, Pioneer Seed Division uh, to, to uh, generate an advantage for uh, renewable materials combined with the integrated science we just talked about and also either external partners or external customers to facilitate the introduction of these materials into society. That's another way that, that partnerships are key to improving the, the picture. And the last component is a dedication towards recognizing that if the planet really is going to recognize the vision I articulated in terms of, of sunlight and arable land, uh, being the source of, of everything, then uh, we really need to also figure out how to use all of the uh, agricultural products and byproducts most efficiently. And today, uh, there are technologies for converting sugars into some at least, well, certainly into, into fuels, but some materials and specialties, uh, and, and we know how to do that from grain. Uh, we are dedicating a substantial amount of our resources to figuring out how to convert uh, waste cellulose, uh, if you will, agricultural byproducts into those same sugars, so that, uh, so that when we can add this piece to what we already know how to do, we will take it the next step in terms of, of, uh, of efficient utilization of arable land. And at the same time, we're working on, on even outside of this box, improving the overall production of both of, both of these uh, inputs for, uh, for the next generation of renewable materials. We also are realistic in terms of addressing incumbency and scale about uh, what we can do today and what we ought to put off until tomorrow. Uh, if you think about it, uh, we have looked at, systematically looked at, uh, converting biomass into new or existing raw materials, new or existing intermediates, new or existing products, and we have a strong bias for the top line because here at least you don't have the incumbency issue. You're at least making something that's familiar. Now, there may be a requalification period, but it's not the same as trying to introduce a whole new product line. So unless something has the potential to be a real new platform for us, 
we will have a bias away from this lower, uh, this, well, certainly this lower endpoint and, and towards the upper line. But uh, we will then uh, look at, at, a, uh, at a retrosynthetic approach uh, using multi-tier screening to assess the opportunities and go after the best ones. To do that, we assemble uh, 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 what I call an integrated science team of uh, biologists, chemists, engineers, people that are experts in sourcing materials, people that can estimate process economics, and we do uh, retrosynthetic approach. Uh, so basically, they're looking from both ways at what are the available uh, renewable raw materials, what are the products that we want to make. We, we, we go build forward from, from one, we, we go backward from the other, and together we, we assess all of the different routes that we can identify for, among other things, whoops, uh, sorry, among other things, uh, the cost that they might uh, be able to pr be produced by, assuming success in the technology development, the risk, both in terms of technology risk and, as I said, market risk if you're dealing with something that's completely new, and then ultimately the platform potential. We take the things that come out the best in terms of that kind of analysis and we subject it to another round of uh, intensive screening where we look at scenario planning. What's going to happen? What, what does this look like uh, not in an era where cellulose is $50 a ton and oil is $150 a barrel, but what if, what if the, the situations are reduced and oil uh, somehow settles down to $60 a barrel and cellulose is $100, $120 uh, a, a ton? What does that do to the picture? And, and from that, we select the, the things that are, are ripe for development now while setting some of them aside for the future, recognizing that as things change, and I believe they will, that they will also be things that we can come back to and that hopefully the, the technology development that we, have, uh, that we have explored during that period will make us even more efficient at developing the next uh, products as it has allowed us to develop the things that we've, that we've already launched. Um, once we've selected those projects, we manage it through what I think people would imagine is a pretty traditional or people know to be a, a pretty traditional uh, stage gate uh, product development, process development framework. Um, this may look like a cartoon, but it is actually our renewable materials pipeline today. And DuPont is a pretty conservative company. We don't tend to announce things until they are either being launched or they make a material difference to our shareholders. And, and because of, uh, of uh, SEC laws, we have to, uh, therefore, divulge them, such as the joint ventures that were established for biobutanol and bioethanol. Um, but in, in, as I said, in most cases, uh, it's only when things are either uh, already launched or are being launched that we reveal them. So uh, what you can see is there are some names in some of these bubbles, and the rest of them are, are not. Those are not, it's not because these are, are just a dream or, or because I had space and, and a little bit of time to fill in this, this matrix, but rather... Uh, because these are actual programs and this is the stage of development today. So I think what you can see is that we continue to mine the, uh, the area for new opportunities and we keep revisiting ones that looked kind of okay before and maybe things have changed. Maybe technology has advanced, maybe, uh, maybe the, the picture of raw material availability has changed. So we continue to uh, look at new things plus, plus uh, uh, things that we've examined before in the areas of fuels, materials, specialties, and even uh, uh, what we call specialty commodities. Uh, and these would be the, the sorts of, of things that have gone into that automotive, automotive market, as well as opportunities that might create whole new business units. Um, and, and the net effect is, when you look at this from that, that point of view of integrated science, this picture probably looks pretty similar to one you saw before, and, and there's a reason for that, because that automotive uh, marketplace and, in general, our, uh, our synthetic materials businesses are actively looking at how to transform themselves from a petrochemical base to a renewable base. And when you, uh, when you add that to the, the picture you just saw, um, what you can see is in the area of biofuels, we have two technologies that are now in, in the pilot stage for significant uh, scale up. We have a number of materials products that have been launched already. You don't see any here that, that we have announced that haven't been, been launched and are growing rapidly. I'll draw your attention to the biopropane diol. It took us 13 years to develop that uh, technology. Uh, so it really is something you have to be in for the long term. During that time, we developed tools uh, that will allow us, if we had to redo this today, to do in, in weeks and months what took us uh, months and years before. But nevertheless, that's the kind of, of, uh, of long-term thinking that we're talking about in this area. It's not, it's not easy. And uh, uh, they say timing is everything. We uh, were short of capacity because the product was growing nicely. We, we started to build two new plants for polytrimethylene terephthalate, the uh, polyester uh, 
uh, product of 1,3-propane diol and terephthalic acid. Uh, and they came online, uh, one of them in December 2008 and one of them in March 2009. Right? They say timing is everything. Not a worse economic climate in our company's history. Those plants were sold out by the end of uh, 2009. So that, I think, points out to you that when you can find something that has actually improved properties uh, and it also has the, uh, the, the reduction in environmental footprints, and I'll use multiple uh, plural in, in that particular case, that it really can be a dramatic success. And that's what we're really looking for. And finally, a couple of new specialties that are in the launch phase. And you can actually buy uh, new harvest omega-3 fatty acid supplements produced from a genetically modified yeast uh, combined with uh, some proprietary separations technologies. Um, yeah, I think it's futurebiotics.com if you're, if you're interested. Uh, try it, you'll like it. Um, <laughs> only commercial, I'll, I'll, I'll toss in. But uh, anyway, to, to wrap things up and summarize, uh, DuPont is investing for the long term in a, dis in a yes, disciplined and systematic way to exploit the, uh, the green chem chemistry focal point of renewable materials as something that we view as absolutely essential to reinventing our company for our third century. Uh, and we think that it's going to take uh, integration of biology, chemistry, and other physical science disciplines uh, along with partnerships to achieve. We, it's, we, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we know that there's significant interest, but there's also significant challenges, including incumbency and scale and, and price performance that all have to be addressed. And so uh, we really look to partnerships and, and organizations like, uh, like uh, the Green Chemistry uh, Institute to be able to help support with technology development and also to, uh, to help with policy development to enable innovation because it's not easy and it's not cheap and it's not short time. So, so if, you, if you, and Bob said to be provocative, so I know this may be uh, provocative to some, um, but basically this is a, an industrial wish list, if you will, from one company. I won't pretend it's, it's for an industry, but a stable, predictable uh, regulatory environment for products and processes, uh, preferably at, at the national level, is something that, if you think about something that's gonna take 13 years to develop, and you're looking at uh, questions about uh, Will it be supported? Won't it be supported in the future? It really makes you step back and say, okay, I might be able to do one of these, but I don't want the risk of doing two of them. If you have a more stable environment, you might, you might uh, in fact, that, that is one of the reasons why our portfolio is, is the size it is today, is because it's a, a balance of risk and reward. Uh, similarly, um, if you think about it, uh, shame on us. In our country, we have, have gone through... Uh, uh, campaigns where we've been very interested in, in uh, renewable energy over time, whenever, usually whenever oil spikes above a certain point. But then when it drifts back down, we, we lose our interest and we're, we're back to buying, uh, buying uh, uh, consumptive cars or, or using energy in a wasteful place. And, and even more damaging, stopping research and development that takes many, many years. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at Brazil, they have, uh, through government supports, uh, managed to develop a biofuels industry that's fully competitive with, with their petrochemical uh, alternatives and, and today are, are uh, sitting in a, in a very nice, nice place that we would, I think, like to be in as a, as a country. And, and finally, there are, are major technology needs. So I think, I think, uh, I think scientists and policymakers, I think uh, governments and, and, uh, and granting agencies and, and also uh, also, smart people around the world can, conti can contribute to reducing the risk in this area. So, uh, and we need all the help we can get, let me, let me assure you of that. So with that, I'll again thank the organizers for allowing us to have a, a seat at the table today, and uh, we do want to be involved in the, in the discussion, so thank you. Thank you, Henry, for that very comprehensive um, discussion. Um, then the uh, question and answer session now will, will be run by uh, Henry and Marty Mulvihill, who is the director of the, um, the Green Chemistry, uh, I guess you're associate director? I don't know what I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just the guy stand, sitting up here. Certainly, <laughs> the, certainly the guy that, that got this whole Green Chemistry program off the ground in, chemi in the chemistry department. So. Well, and I if, I might, open for if I might say from just some of the things I, I've already heard both today and, and last night at dinner uh, has, has uh, championed the philosophy of doing what you can now while, while envisioning a, a, uh, a much more uh, uh, dramatic future and, and really as a result taking the steps necessary to, 
to get uh, people thinking and, and to get a, a, a conference put together today that's, as I understand it, oversubscribed. So I, I congratulate you. Thanks. So I'd like to uh, start the discussion with a question that comes up as I talk to some of our stakeholders around campus that deals with information. And in fact, uh, DuPont says, you know, we are a material, technology, and knowledge provider. And I think that information is often one of the key things for all of us, whether we're policymakers or chemists or anyone else to make decisions. And what I'm curious about is kind of a two-part question. First, how do you provide information about green chemistry metrics along your own supply chain? But then secondly, what are the things that would need to be in place in order for you to share that information with all of the interested parties, including the NGOs, the government agencies, and the other folks who want to help make these decisions? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, gosh. Uh, let me answer it in also a couple of ways. The first is that uh, information is expensive, and we know that, and, and we pay for it all the time uh, when we go out and, and, uh, and source it rather than develop it internally. But even when you develop it internally, it's expensive. And so finding a way to protect it and, and uh, allow, a, uh, allow a proprietary position so that one can earn a return on all of that investment that our shareholders have have put into, uh, into developing a solution is important. And so having a robust patent system is what I see as probably the, the best answer to both of your questions. One is uh, it allows us to, to carve out uh, some territory while at the same time uh, putting a stake in the ground and saying, okay, this can be done. Uh, and hopefully people who say, gee, I think I can do that even a little bit better will come to us and, and will partner to, to take things the next step. But it will also at least assure that our stakeholders, uh, who our, our shareholders who've invested in us and who've put in $1.7 billion a year in R&D can earn the kind of return that all of you and your pension funds expect uh, to be coming to you in, in, uh, in later in life. Uh, so, so that's important. Uh, transparency is also important for the reasons you pointed out. We do a lot of this work in concert with other companies with other uh, academic labs, government labs, institutes, research institutes, and if people don't know what we're working on, if people don't know what we're interested in, first of all, uh, it's unlikely we'll make the connection or it's less likely we'll make the connection. So it's important to be at least transparent in that regard in terms of, uh, of working with others uh, like NGOs. I mean, you, you see that we've done that in in terms of climate change uh, legislation, in terms of the nano risk framework. It's something that, that we find, uh, it's that seat at the table that we talked about earlier, that, that we can bring a certain perspective to an issue, but we know we don't have it all. And by meeting with people that have uh, the different perspectives, we can arrive at a robust solution that will, you know, it won't meet anybody's needs 100%, but it'll meet everybody's needs 80%. And I think that's what, what your institute has the real potential to bring to this area. You've, got, you've assembled an unprecedented uh, uh, diversity of, of competencies outside of the, the physical and biological sciences uh, to address uh, many of the underlying issues. So did that, did that answer your question? I think so. Okay. Do we have some other questions from the audience? Go for it, Mike. You choose. We have a couple. Thanks, Henry. Um, nice talk. Um, I'm glad to see DuPont is investing so much in agriculture. I think that's really important as we move ahead. And I'm, I have a, um, a question about direction. Uh, DuPont has always been a chemical company, and you know the incorporation of material science and biology is a good thing to see. But I, I'm wondering if DuPont is thinking about going so far as to um, work on biocontrol solutions that don't really fall in the chemical category. And by this I mean that with current uh, pesticide solutions, we've got uh, air and water contamination issues, we've got resistance issues on the part of the insects, we have persistence of these things in the environment. There's all kinds of things that come up with that. And um, are, is DuPont thinking about looking into microbial pesticides that outcompete the bad fungi in the soil? Uh, beneficial insects that are able to, um, you know, go after the pest insects. If DuPont got behind this in a big way, you guys could make a huge difference. Is that even is that on your radar screen? Um, I'll say yes and no. First of all, let me back up and say that um, you're absolutely right. DuPont, um, to most of the people in this audience, 
and, and uh, the, the DuPont that, that you and I grew up with was, in fact, a chemicals and materials company. However, um, that hasn't always been the case, right? In our first century, people would have known DuPont, but they would have known it for black powder or, or explosives. Um, it was only in, in that, uh, that second century from, from well, really the, uh, the 19 teens to, to the end of the century that, that we were, that, that synthetic materials uh, derived from petroleum or, or other sources was really on, on our radar screen at all. So it's not probably, so maybe it's not in that context as surprising that the company continues to evolve and it probably did surprise a number of you that, um, that we're spending 60% of our R&D on production agriculture improvements uh, because it doesn't sound like a polymer company and many people still think of DuPont as a polymer company. So um, i point out a couple of things. One is that, that even 40% of $1.7 billion is a lot of, of investment in the future for, for materials. But to answer your, your question more directly, there are some of those things that are being looked at. Uh, we don't have the competencies in, in some of the others to really make a contribution there. Um, so we have not really focused on them, but they're good thoughts for the future. I would say there's probably been also more emphasis on improving plant health uh, by, by making more vigorous uh, plants that, that uh, can defend themselves and by, by stimulating growth of beneficial bacteria that, that enable um, uh, much more efficient utilization of fertilizers and water uh, than has been done before than there might be in, in uh, in entomology, where we're really not an expert. And the same is true, you know, I, I don't mean to have given short shrift to the alternate energy area. There are lots of solutions that are going to have to play a role in meeting an energy future for our society as well as our planet. Um, we just don't have the competencies to address all of them. We don't have a lot to contribute in wind energy, um, but it'll undoubtedly be, be uh, important. Um, as will geothermal and some other things, wave energy, that we, we may be able to supply materials to, but other than that, don't have a lot of deep competencies in. The, the ones that we do have deep competencies in, like photovoltaics and, and, and biofuels, are, are the places where we're, where we're making the, the investment. So, so, yeah, and I think stay tuned. Uh, you know, we, we announced that we were trying to become even more involved in nutrition uh, here with an acquisition um, that we hope will we'll go through uh, of the Danisco company to add to our competencies, uh, greater depth in, in some of those nutritional fields. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I'm Lynn Goldman, George Washington University. And um, I was wondering the extent to which DuPont has been able to think about um, this um, ability to use um, biological um, molecules, uh, you know, the products of farming um, for um, chemistry and materials, kind of in the context of some of what we also heard from um, Dr. Anastas earlier today, that there's, you know, to some extent also considerations about the inputs to that, you know, the soil, um, pesticides, fertilizer, I'd add water to that as well, how water is used, what happens to the water, but also um, the competing uses of that, mm -hmm. that um, those sugars can be sources of calories and those cellulose can be a source of animal feed as well as being, you know, for materials. And that that's a, obviously another human need that has to be met. And um, I think, you know, has anybody really looked at kind of what is the capacity to produce materials um, using farming and um, in the context of producing food? Um, I'm trying to think how best to respond because your points are right on target. Um, I actually have some charts, if Marty, you want to put them up, um, that, that speak to what the potential is, but I, it might take longer than, than we have, and I'm mindful of the fact that I'm standing between you and lunch. Uh, so let me just say that, first of all, um, uh, pardon me? You want to start? I, I'll get right on it then. Uh, I, we believe that absolutely, uh, you're exactly right, we need to meet all of society's needs from those resources. and. And, you know, I'm wearing a wool suit and a cotton shirt and, and leather shoes, and those all came from, from animals grown on land that could have been used to produce uh, vegetable protein. Um, and and uh, I, I can assure you that me going naked would be a much worse alternative, but, but, <laughs> but we, need to, uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that we're going to have to be meeting some of those needs, uh, and we're going to have to balance all of that, and, and that's why we say that that our belief is that the way to do that is to dramatically improve production agriculture. And if you look at it, um, 
if I look at the, the pipeline of just uh, U.S. corn yields uh, that are in the profit objective for our Pioneer Seed Division, we're looking at a 40% increase per acre in yield uh, over the next seven to eight years. And that's staggering. That's unprecedented. If you look at the, if you look at the grain production curves, they, they've taken a, uh, a discontinuous turn in terms of productivity. And then when you add on top of that, the fact that U.S. agriculture is head and shoulders already uh, leading the world in terms of productivity, and you look at the number of, of acres under cultivation and what could be produced if you just brought them up to, to uh, even uh, the standards uh, that the U.S. enjoys today, it's absolutely staggering. And it's not just true for corn, it's true for soybeans and rice and, and, uh, and sorghum and, and other uh, materials on uh, high quality arable land and even for things like uh, switchgrass and other cellulosics in, in areas that are, are considered marginal land. So that's, I think, the, our view is that we need to meet the needs for all of those things from the arable land, recognizing that, that, uh, that whether it's today or 10 years from now, you don't want me up here naked, I, I assure you. And, and, uh, and so uh, we need to find we need to find harmony, and, and the way to do that is increasing supply rather than, than worrying about uh, uh, whether I should be, wh whether I'm better off wearing leather shoes or, or, uh, or uh, synthetics. So. so right before I invite us to lunch, I also think it's an interesting thing to remember in the few food, fuel, and materials world. You know, we get all of it from petroleum for the most part now. Only at so ninety eight percent of the stuff we make materials comes from petroleum, but that only re represents three to five percent of the total petroleum we pull out of the ground. We burn most of it, so I think it would be much easier to make our materials out of this stuff than it is going to be to make all of our fuel out of this stuff. I mean, that's just an interesting thing to think about. I mean, chemistry industry is a petrochemical industry, but uh, it is smaller compared to what we use for the energy. Well, and I'll, I'll be honest um, that in, in, uh, in the early 90s, you know, I was, was one of the, the eye rollers who said, oh, geez, you know, our, our grain-based ethanol uh, technologies are, are nothing more than a shameless agricultural sub subsidy or, or a farm subsidy. And, and yet now I look at it in hindsight and say, okay, in those days, virtually every gallon of ethanol that was produced was underwater, if you will. It, it was producing less energy than it took to, to produce it in the first place. And so... By any measure, it was it was subsidized. Today, as far as I know, there are no uh, no grain-based ethanol plants that actually don't produce more in case in some cases 15 to 20 percent more energy uh, than is required to to, uh, to to produce them. That's not good enough, and that's why you know cellulose uh, has to be the answer for the future, uh, along with lots of other renewable renewable uh, sunlight-driven energies like wave and wind and and, and photochemical, but but uh, you know, it, it really does point out um, that if you have a long-term vision, uh, it can be uh, something that will attract rock throwers at the beginning, uh, but in the long run, uh, shows us the way. You know, the Prius isn't the uh, isn't the uh, zero polluting vehicle, but on the other hand, I think it opened a lot of our eyes to what might be possible, and it is it has really enabled things like the Volt and and, and other things to uh, come along and be better and better and. And it's not standing still either, it's, it's also continuing to evolve. So that's my kind of philosophy is um, having, having been sobered by, by being wrong in the early 90s, uh, I, I've now come to the conclusion that I need to, uh, to be more generous and look for the long term, not, not just uh, what's happening today. And so before we thank uh, Henry, I want to let you know we have our lunches waiting outside. Just go grab a box. We're hoping for a slightly sunnier day. The good news is we have uh, classrooms downstairs where, um, that are open that you can eat in. There will even be some uh, green chemistry videos playing in the background for you. Um, it's all uh, coming from bioplastics and other stuff that's compostable, so please find a compost bin to put all of your stuff in when you're done. And I know there were a lot more questions, and luckily he's going to be back on our panel discussion in the afternoon. So hopefully some of you who had questions will get a chance to ask him. Thank you.